Obviously, we've had a long day, and congratulations on the stamina of all the people still in the room. That's great. Congratulations uh, coming up, and the first of those is by uh, Dr. Os Osiretin Igaro. And he's going to talk about exposure assessment and micronuclei induction in populations exposed to electronic waste. And I think this is a really important and rather neglected topic, actually, in, in public health and planetary health, because we know there's a lot of exporting of electronic waste from Europe and other parts of the world into Africa, and yet there hasn't been much work on the health impacts of that and the implications for public and planetary health. So it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you and ask you to say, give your presentation. Good evening. I think the introduction I'll be giving is quite okay. I'd like to go straight to the presentation and I'll be guided by this outline. The electronic waste uh, actually could be defined as uh, waste electrical and electronic appliances that have been destined for reuse, uh, for discard, for for, for resale and for recycling. And the scourge of this waste is global. And of course, in developing countries, the e-waste issue is, uh, the reprocessing is substantial, but uh, unregulated. And of course, it's reported that Africa, and at times you see Tossy can't release into the environment, the soil, hair, and water, and even plant around in the course of burning, and the course of dismantling, the course of soldering, may attempt to repair and reuse. And all of these activities have their public health implications. You know, most of the chemicals tossy can't in electronic waste, as there are up to 1,000 of this in a given electronic waste, and some of them are carcinogenic, neurotoxic, immunotoxicants, genotoxicants, and some of them have potential for hazard that have not been fully elucidated. And uh, uh, this have impact on planetary Earth because toxic metals release polybrometed diphenyls and polybrometed biphenyls, which are used as flame retardant in the electronic waste. They are released into the environment, and in the course of burning, they release carbon dioxide, and in the course of manufacturing of electronic waste, carbon dioxide in huge volumes are released. And of course, collectively, these Toscans find their ways to the ecosystem, and in the ecosystem, it enters the food chain and will become part of the, pe the people, factors that will have negative impact in terms of our health. Of course, it can happen in one country, but can be transmitted to another country through water, both running water, surface water, underground water, and through the water table to the oceans. And these form the rationale for our study. One, because Lagos, Nigeria is the largest e-waste dump yard in West Africa, and it is dominated by metals, cadmium, Aluminium as displayed on this table, using from uh, uh, estimated from the whole blood. Then, of course, uh, we use a uh, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry, and, and also we carried out uh, micronuclear induction by microscopy as previously de de uh, de uh, defined. Now, standard surgical analysis was carried out for data management and the results are as shown. The table look, looks uh, cloud, uh, crowded, but I have a summary beneath. This is the occupational environmental exposure pattern of the participants, 
and uh, this is the risk awareness indicators in the e-waste exposed and underexposed participant, and here is the summary. Table three, frequency of exposure was up to six hours per day, six days per week, and 9,360 hours in every five years. The route of exposure found included eyes, skin, mouth, and nose. And of course, the use of personal protective equipment found was that 89.76% did not use any personal protective equipment. Why? 10.24% 10, 10 used inadequate personal protective equipment. Up to 64% lacked basic awareness about the risk of exposure to electronic waste. The method of disposal of unwanted electronic waste, you know, in China and, in, and uh, Sweden, exposure to toxic metal has been associated with electronic waste exposure also. And this appears to be in agreement with the findings in those locations. It's well established that there's metal-induced oxidative stress, and this is a well-established mechanism for carcinogenesis. And in res with respect to micronuclear induction, micronuclear induction, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's it, it has to do with when there is general toxicity and there is poor mechanism for chromosomal reassembly in the course of cell, cell division. And this leads to the formation of micronuclei and is indicative of genome instability, which is a precursor of the carcinogenic process. In fish and other lower animals exposed to toxicant, there have been reported cases of high micronuclear induction. In the present study, they observe higher frequency of micronuclear in the e-waste workers and the environmental cohort appear to suggest a possibility of cytogenic aberration, which is a precursor of the carcinogenic process. And this is a mechanism for formation of micronuclear when there is general toxicity. The end product there for the, at the upper end is micronuclear why the lower one is uh, a normal cell from cell division. And this whole thing happens when there is repression of tumor suppressor protein as a result of high levels of toxicant, which leads to low uh, DNA repair mechanism, and, and it may contribute to chromotrypsis, which is chromosomal reassembly, uh, and uh, leading to micronuclear induction. So the utility of the study we have reported, it, we, from this study, we have um, formed a concept model for e-waste uh, 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 participants with respect to cancer risk. And we have also had, this is the first human population-based study. There is, uh, it also helped us to intervene by providing personal protective equipment, exposure, and may be associated with the formation of micronuclear, which is a precursor of the carcinogenic process. And this uh, is our acknowledgement. We acknowledge University of Benin, the U.S. Society of Chemistry that partly funded the work, Tertiary Education Trust Fund, TED Fund, Climate, uh, Center on Climate Change and Planetary Aid for the sponsorship given me, uh, consenting e-waste workers and other co-workers and the almighty God. Thank you for listening. Well, thanks for a very, very interesting and thought-provoking uh, and very worrying, to some extent, uh, presentation. So we have perhaps time for, for one question, but also hopefully people will approach you later to have a, a wider discussion. So question. Yeah, please. Um, good evening. Uh, I'm Ramatila Janga from MRC Gambia. Um, I just want to ask about the, uh, the Cheeto Max. Has it been... Uh, uh, validated in any other populations? And it's safety, actually. Okay, can I answer? Please. Okay, well, the Cheto mask, um, you know, it's used as a pharmaceutical excipient. Uh, Cheto sun is used as a pharmaceutical excipient, and it's been approved by the FDA for use in that regard. 
Chito San is not new, but what is new is we are converting the environmental waste, snake shells, and producing Chito San from it and impregnating it onto a nose mask. So the, the, the safety of Chito San is well established. But uh, we are using the electronic waste workers right now. We also intend to use it in other occupational cohorts like Benin or Nigeria bronze casters. We just got a grant to do a, an occupational risk assessment for Nigerian bronze casters as well as environmental assessment. So we also want to use the opportunity to seek collaborators because we have to try our Chito mask in that population also to answer your question. But for someone who is interested in joining us in our study on Nigerian broadcasters, occupational and environmental risk assessment, I think you could get across to me using my email. We need collaborators. It's a large study. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Jimmy Whitworth, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. If I could join in this debate about Kaisersan here. Um, as a cider maker, I'm very interested in this because it is used both in beer brewing and cider making as a clearing agent, this same um, uh, product. And it's very effective as at actually getting particles and getting them to, to yeah. go down. One of the issues that is well known, though, in brewing is that people who have allergies to shellfish or seafood and the like do respond badly to, to this product. So that may be something to look out for in, in your workers. Thank you. OK, thanks. Um, well, uh, thanks again for the presentation. Uh, we'll move on now to um, another important topic, understanding the health impact of climate change in West Africa. And this is a review of current knowledge and research gaps by um, Yusuf Adabisi, who is the Associate Director for Research at Global Health Focus Africa. So welcome, and uh, over to you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. So my name is Adebise Yusuf Adebayo. I'm a final year pharmacy student of the University of Baden, Nigeria. I'm also the Associate Director for Research at Global Health Focus Africa. So basically, um, my presentation is not saying anything new. It's just going to be a clarion call to researchers, professionals, funders, government bodies to actually um, put climate change and its earth impacts to be one of the major things to be considered in these uh, decades. Because a lot of things have been happening that's actually um, due to climate change, but little to no evidence has actually been um, made available to actually advance knowledge and inform policymaker regarding the impact of um, climate change in the society. So as you all know, climate change results into enormous threat to human health and is one of the biggest global health threats of the 21st century. However, compared to other disciplines and sectors, the epidemiological and medical communities have been slow to turn their interest to the, uh, to the climate impact on health. So climate change and health is a growing area of research and there are direct and indirect mechanisms as regards to how um, climate change can actually have enormous impact on health. Africa has been shown to be uh, the region as that is actually prone to futuristic impact of, our, of climate as regards health. But there need to be data to actually uh, communicate to policymakers to be able to inform changes or implementation of such uh, uh, findings. But shockingly, we are able to find out that from this study that in West Africa in particular, there are little to um, um, no research on some areas. So that's what actually inspired this um, review and this presentation today. So sorry, this is not clear. This is just showing um, the projection of how uh, the risk profile of West Africa, of, um, of how climate change is going to affect different areas, including agriculture, health, human health, ecosystem, and others. 
The Zulu journals are actually indexed in PubMed and Google Scholars that are included in the study. And um, using the search term, they actually uh, give the opportunity to be able to see studies that are actually published based on these uh, four headings. So, essentially, the criteria will be studies that are not uh, carried out in West Africa. So, at the end of the search, you are able to include 15 papers, including relevant reports, in uh, this review. So, for extreme temperature, association between climate change and health impact of, tem of temperature on mortality or no infectious disease were recognized, but inconsistent. Uh, some studies will actually um, state that, okay, if there's increase in temperature, it's going to lead to an increase in this. But another one will say the opposite. So I think what needs to be done to actually address it is if we have more research to actually done to actually see how extreme temperature can actually affect, uh, can actually affect human health. We are we were able to provide the opportunity to be able to choose from uh, the best of the best studies that actually showed the actual impact of extreme temperature on health. So cardiovascular and infectious respiratory disease st uh, strongest association with mortality and um, mobility risk factor risk caused by increased temperature. So there are still few studies. So this is an area where we can have young researchers our funders to actually see what we can do, to actually see more studies of how extreme temperature is actually affecting health of women in West Africa. So altered um, rainfall pattern, this is another thing I would actually try to see. So altered rainfall studies predominantly focus on impact of infectious and vector bond disease, but some they still lack a consistent association. Where by a study actually tell you that it's going to lead to, uh, if there is an increase in rainfall, it's going to lead to this. If there's going to be a decrease, it's going to lead to this. But if, there's, if there are more studies, we actually help us to be able to pick uh, from the best and understand how this thing is actually affecting us. So this is another call again for us to actually put, put in effort to be able to know how other rain, uh, rainfall pattern is actually affecting health in uh, West Africa. Rise of sea level. I don't know whether there's any local journal or local article that have been published on this, but based on our search, we're unable to find out any association. No study on association on the health outcomes of sea level rise on both infectious disease and non clinical disease was identified. But like I said earlier, if you don't have access to local journals, it's only journals, articles that are actually indexed in PubMed and Google Scholars that are included in the study. So extreme weather events in West Africa, across the West Africa region, most studies, even though they are limited, examine single weather variables, but long-term variation and trend on health remain uncertain, e.g. rainfall, um, malaria transmission. This is actually another opportunity for us, early career researchers, professionals, to actually put in effort to actually generate data to, infer, to influence policy and practice as regards to how climate change is going to impact health in West Africa. Um, additional notes, cardiovascular uh, mortality varies by season with higher mortality rates in the hot dry season. I already said that earlier, but there are still some slight exceptions to that based on stu some studies saying the opposite of what um, I just um, said. So presence of both temporal and spatial aspects to transmission opens the possibility of seasonal, seasonally timed factor bond disease control and the potential of, develop, of the development of early warning systems. So some extensive studies carried out in West African uh, countries are not often extended to understanding the health impact. Uh, some studies are actually carried out to understand social economic impact and other um, sociology or environmental research. But most of these studies don't actually link these two how it's going to affect health. These are not things that we can actually look into to be able to generate more data to advance knowledge as regards climate change in West Africa. So malaria is the most documented single disease. This, I can find a lot of papers that actually talk about how climate change is linked to uh, malaria. So, but malaria is not the only disease that we have. We should extend our harm to other disease to so actually provide more data on how we can best uh, adapt to these uh, changes, changes as early as possible. So much existing work has looked at the effects of climate on specific disease without making clear connection to overall changes in population health. 
So how are people actually adapting to these changes? This is another area that we can actually look into to generate more data. So another point is interaction between the HIV and rain-fed food production capacity, impact of drought on child nutrition, disease impact of floods, changing pattern of malaria transmission, and the impact of natural disasters are some of the things we can actually look into. So next, uh, commendable. So concerted effort on the part of African government aid, aid administrator, aid workers to ensure the necessary gap, attention is given to multidisciplinary research on the subject so that meaningful control measures can be uh, formulated. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much for a very uh, presentation. I think clearly identifying a number of important uh, research gaps. So open for questions. We've got time perhaps for one Possibly two quick questions. Yep, at the front, sorry. Just to comment out, I have a question. My name is Professor Sidatiapa. I like recommendation number two. And uh, before the end of 2020, this year, there's a high probability this initiative will try to address your recommendation too, in terms of capacity building for medical professionals in West Africa. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Very good. Very exciting. Yes, I would say there's a lot of interest now in including climate change in medical curricula, a number of international initiatives, and it's great to see that there's one here in West Africa as well. Could I, I just ask um, briefly whether you looked at some of the broader issues like uh, migration, uh, maybe even conflict. Did you find any papers at all looking at some of these broader societal changes? Poverty, for example, would be another one. The World Bank, for example, had a report on climate change and poverty, and they did suggest that quite a lot of people could be forced back into poverty from climate change, particularly here in, uh, well, in, in Africa generally, and that, of course, would have big effects on health, although it may not be called health. If you do a search term on it, it may not come up, but it's very important for health. Thank you. Um, basically, for that, um, the scope of this study is just to find the link between those four criteria uh, criteria and their impact on health. Sure. I think we'll be on that. Yeah. But, uh, okay. Thanks. Well, well let's uh, let's move on. Um, and uh, thank you so much. <laughs> and the next speaker. Sorry, my phone has uh, seized up. Here we go. Um, so the next speaker is known to you all because she appeared yesterday. Uh, Sokna Thiam, who's a postdoctoral scientific collaborator, uh, Swiss TPH, and also IR. ESSEF in Dakar, and she's going to talk about climate change and diarrheal diseases, um, giving the results of a time series analysis in urban, uh, urban and rural settings in Senegal. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Handy, for the introduction. My name is uh, Sohne Jama, as he said. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute in Basel and at, the, uh, at ERSF in Dakar, which is a global health institute. I'm going to present a case study assessing the effect of uh, climate factors and diarrheal disease in Bour, Senegal. I'm going to give a little introduction about as you can with 15 million people Senegal is one of the most urbanizing countries vulnerable to climate change uh, impact in West Africa. Since 1960, the uh, Senegal climate is begun to change, which it mean annual temperature have been reported to increase by 0 0.9 degrees. We know that uh, extreme we know that increasing temperature are associated with extreme weather events. Therefore, the country is vulnerable to sea level rise, sea level rise, which can lead to great flood-related health epidemic like uh, diarrheal diseases and cholera, uh, infrastructure damage, increasing saline and intrusion of surface and groundwater bodies, and uh, reduction in the quality and availability of drinking water. 
All of these have a significant impact on global health. In the next coming minute, my presentation will focus on the important element of the case study I'm going to present. We know that, and many of you may know that diarrheal disease is still of significant public health concern in sub-Saharan Africa, as you can see in this map showing the distribution of diarrhea mortality rate among children under five. In Senegal, diarrhea is one, given one of the main cause of disease in children under five, as you can see here in this uh, diagram. And the mortality is uh, like 80% mortality rate among children under five. Here I'm trying to give some projection about uh, diarrheal disease under a changing climate. The World Health Organization, through the uh, quantitative microbial assessment report, reporting a study that uh, projecting an additional 48,000 and 33,000 deaths in children aged under five years due to diarrheal disease for 2030 and 2050. As you can see in this table, you can see that uh, you can see that the risk will be higher in Africa and, and Asia. And in 2013, Sub-Saharan Sub Africa will have the greater mortality burden attributable to climate change impact. Even climate change, even diarrheal disease remain among the leading cause of mortality and morbidity in children, and climate change impact is expected to increase the burden of the disease, there is a, the quantity of evidence that assessing the effect of climate change and diarrheal disease in Africa is very, very low and we, from the trend analysis. You can see here in this table that there is an increase in uh, temperature, in the average and minimum temperature, and also in rainfall. And this means this uh, funding are consistent with change observed for West African, where average and mean temperature have been increased over the 150 years. This graph shows the distribution, the, trend, the annual trend of maximum, minimum, average, and rainfall. And you can see here that there is a change in the climate parameter in Senegal. This change can we observe it in temperature and rainfall may have a significant impact on diarrheal disease. Here we, we present the incidence rate from, from the data. You can see here that there is a high incidence of diarrheal disease, which is 21.1% 20, and you can see that at the seasonal, there is a seasonal fluctuation. Diarrheal disease was higher in the cold, dry season, which is from January, December to March, and from the raining season, which is from July to October. We also did some uh, analysis to estimate the effect of uh, climate factors on diarrhea. And you can see here that diarrheal disease were more likely to occur in urban area and in cold, dry season, where temperature was a little bit low with, with uh, a, a, a low amount of also rainfall. But if you go back to the trend analysis, you can see that minimum temperature have increased over the time. During this, this means is that temperature, increasing temperature, increase also the risk of diarrheal disease in this area. And you can see an increasing trend here down from 2011 to 2014, the risk of diarrheal disease have increased. You can see here that 
uh, temperature above to 26 degrees was associated with 80% increase in diarrheal disease cases. And also minimum temperature above to 80, 80 degrees was also associated with 13% increase in diarrhea cases. And we also find that uh, rainfall above to 57 millimeter was also increased with 34% in diarrhea cases. We did a separate analysis to, to see if there is a difference between the effect in rural and urban area. You can see here that in urban area, one, incre one degree increase of uh, average temperature above 24 degree was associated with 5% increase in diarrheal cases. And one millimeter increase of rainfall above 50 millimeter was also associated with 31%. And in rural area, we did not find any significant relationship between rainfall and diarrheal disease. But temperature effect was higher in rural area than urban area. We found in both settings that diarrhea was positively associated with average temperature above 24 degrees in the current month. And high rainfall had a significant positive effect on diarrhea in urban area, also in the current month than rural area. To just summarize, I say that this was the first step to uh, through understanding climate driver on diarrheal disease in Senegal. And the study indicated significant climate interactive uh, uh, relationship. We just find that high rainfall and uh, high temperature, also night temperature, was also significantly associated with diarrheal disease incidence in children in the city of Moore. And diarrhea was more associated with temperature in rural than urban. And for that, we think that effective health intervention program in the cold to dry season where diarrhea were most common and the raining season, focusing on morbidity control and prevention are needed. And particular attention should be paid to urban area in order to reduce the disease burden in this context of climate variability and change. Just I would like before to end to acknowledge my boss supervisor for, for guiding me, Le Professor Gelado Sisse, Professor Jürg Itzenger, Professor Suleiman Mou, and all the co-authors of this paper and also to thanks to the organizing committee of this conference for give, selecting me for oral presentation, giving me also the opportunity to come with the travel grant. Thank you. <laughs> Just one minute more, Professor Handy, if uh, we am ah. part of the International Society of Environmental Epidemiology, and we have an African chapter, and I'm uh, the secretary of the chapter. And we plan to have, because of this a big event in West in Africa, we plan to have a site event. Tomorrow we have a site event to show the, the, the aim of the chapter, what we, we have to do. People who are interested to join this society and be a member of the African chapter are welcome to this side meeting. I think we'll be in this same room tomorrow at 2 p.m. Well, thank you so much, Sabna, for a great presentation and for the invitation, which I'm sure many people will want to attend that. So, questions? Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much, um, Dr. Cham, for that nice presentation. Um, I have, uh, my name is Damkan, and I'm from MRC. Um, I have one question. Um, did you look at the etiology of diarrhea, um, which... Um, pathogens are the ones causing diarrhea? Because I know of some studies uh, um, done in Senegal, especially in Dakar, which showed that bacterial infections um, causing diarrhea were more common during the dry season, while viral um, diarrhea was more common during the wet season. So I don't know whether you've seen, you have data on the etiology of um, diarrhea and whether the pattern is the same in Boer. 
Thank you very much for your case, interesting question. Unfortunately, in this study, we did not look for the pathogens because we did not have any pathogen data. But we, now we are working on a project. We are trying to make some uh, analysis to know the, which pathogens are more responsible. I know the study, you, you mentioned it, and it is, was right. But in our study, we did not do any, any pathogens analysis. But we are now project on going on that in the same cities and other where we can will see the pathogens in, among children, the cells of children, and among water quality to see if there is the same pathogen in something like, but not in this study. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the presentation. It was very interesting and actually the results are very striking. So I, I just um, would like a bit more details on the analysis because I did not understand exactly. So uh, when you say that a higher temperature increases the, the risk of diarrhea, are you comparing uh, between years? Or are you, uh, so what is the comparison that you are doing? Uh, each of the years? So our final presentation is also on a very innovative topic which has been rather neglected in, in public health. It's about marine litter and health in Africa. We know that we're transforming the oceans in various ways. And whilst the ecologists have looked at this, the, the public health community has been rather slow to look at the health implications of that. So it's great to have a presentation uh, from Joseph uh, Ayatia, who's a PhD student at the University of Ghana. Okay. Thank you and good evening. So throughout the day, we've been looking at the impacts or looking at the land pollution and the air. So it's time, it's important we also look at the ocean because as he said, it's often neglected. And for a healthy planet, we need, there's a nexus between the land, air, and water. There should be an, uh, an essential synergy between them for the planets to be healthy. So what is marine litter? Marine litter is any manufactured process solid material which is often left in the coastal and marine environment. And as you can see, most of marine litter is generated on our land. Most of the land or most of our litter is generated on land. About 80% is generated on land, just about 20% is generated on the sea. And 80% of the marine litter generated is mostly plastic. So this is a picture of uh, a popular spot in Ghana, which is heavily polluted, Abdubloshi. It's an e-waste site, and if you look at the kind of litter in there, all this litter generated on land, it feeds into the, the, the ocean. And you can imagine what it will have, the impact it will have on the health of the marine ecosystem. Again, 80% of marine litter is plastic. So let's look at where most of these plastic is being generated from. And as you can see, China is leading or is the number one contributor of plastic in our ocean. And when we look at Africa, we realize that we have five countries in Africa that are also contributing to plastic debris in our ocean. We have Nigeria leading. We have, sorry, we have Egypt, then Nigeria, then South Africa, Algeria, and Morocco. So these are five countries which are contributing to plastic debris entering our ocean today. And again, this is a map showing the amount of mismanaged plastic waste entering our ocean. So improper or poor waste management practices on land or the inability for us to properly deal with plastic on land has a potential of it ending up in our oceans. So if you look at the green circles, the green circles are estimate of 2010, the yellow indicates projections for 2025. So let's look at a country like Nigeria. So the green circle Nigeria estimates that about 1 million tons of plastic is, was mismanaged in 2010 and is going to double in 2025. So just imagine if this amount of plastic is being mismanaged 
at this time, where is it going to end up? The probability that it's ending up in our marine ecosystem is high. What is going to happen to the marine life? Again, marine litter is very important, and we need to take a critical look at it because it impacts about six of the SDGs, no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, sustainable cities. We looked at sustainable cities today, life below water. So marine litter is essential and it affects these SDGs. So it has to be taken seriously. Let's look at the environmental health impacts it is having because all the litter that ends up in the ocean will impact the marine organisms in there. Most of the time, there are two ways by which the organisms encounter the litter through ingestion and through entanglement. So if you look at recent studies that have been conducted over the years, you see that seabirds, sea turtles, ghost crabs, whales, fish, that study was conducted in the lab, and sea turtles are either ingesting the, the debris or are entangled by them. And looking at the impact it is having on them, some of them are dying, they are experiencing um, obstruction in their guts, and in some cases like sea turtles, it is reducing their population size because the plastics have chemicals in them and these chemicals are leading to negative effects on the organisms. And research has also shown that these marine litter, mostly plastic, are being identified in some of the food we eat today. Even in drinking water, we have PET, PP, and PE. All these are plastic polymers and research is showing that these contain chemicals which can lead to um, so many diseases, cardiovascular um, damage, um, oxidative stress, even in fish. So we just imagine the fish on environmental health, the impact of marine litter or looking at the distribution of marine litter, the, the types and sources or the amount of litter, but no one is particularly paying attention to the health implications. How is it going to affect we as humans? Because we depend on the marine ecosystem for food. It's a source of livelihood. So no one is paying attention to it. Looking at the trends of marine litter research over the years from 1960 up to 2010, you realize that most of the work again is looking at the amount of, of marine litter in the ecosystem, policy initiatives, transport ingestion, but nobody is tackling the health implications. So again, Africa is the least study continent when it comes to marine litter research. South Africa is leading, West Africa is nowhere. And uh, the unfortunate thing is that the scientific community is focusing on the types and sources of marine litter, the transport and distribution, marine ecosystem health and policy issues, but the focus of public health, the human health aspect is limited. And I recommend that there should be increased funding for marine litter public health research, especially on the continent. Thank you. Well, thanks uh, for another excellent and thought-provoking uh, presentation. You've really identified, I think, an important uh, research gap, and it would be good idea if we can feed some of these ideas through to the research funders. Yeah. So any, uh, any f yeah, questions? Yeah, please. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm Zach and I'm from the MRC Cambia. I think this is generally for what we have been discussing here. We are trying to find evidence to, for the effect of climate change on health, but we need to also understand the level of evidence that is coming up and the methods we use in establishing the, the relationships between climate change and health, like rainfall patterns, temperatures. Because sometimes most of what we see is like there are ecological studies. They say, see, this is going up, this is coming down. I think that is what Anna was trying to drive the previous presenter. What have you adjusted for? What, have, what else have you taken account of? And coming to your presentation, in what ways do you think, the, what are some of the methods you think we could use to find the link between marine pollution and health? So what are the ways we can find uh, the link between marine pollution? Again, there should be more studies. There should be a, a focused inquiry into the links. 
there should be more it looks like in africa other things are being focused on but there's no link there hasn't been the efforts to establish a link and i believe that because most people or west africa we depend on the ocean we depend on marine ecosystem there should be an inquiry to investigate what happens because there's the evidence that the fishes are dying so it might get to a point where we are not getting the, the catch we expect and it could be because of marine pollution so there should be a, a concerted effort there should be an intentional inquiry into trying to establish the link because if it is affecting the the health of fish and we are consuming the fish what would they have on our health as well so people should do there should be funding there should be yeah the government should also play a part in looking at that because yeah it's, it's part of the economy so i think one of the other things we could do if i could just add is to um, look at this in relation to some of the cohort studies that are going on off coastal populations so we should be building into these cohort studies which often look at conventional risk factors and, and health outcomes measures of consumption of marine products for example um, perhaps estimates of some of the chemicals that we know are like to appear, some of the uh, chemicals that you've out outlined, including yeah. endocrine disruptors, by the way, yeah. which can be detected in the blood and other body fluids. Yeah. And we probably should be measuring those.